And we're back with more of the Pope on Film. Buddy! Yes. If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, the Pope on Film. I mean, who is it nowadays in this day and age? This podcast is sweeping the nation. This podcast is swiffer, wet jetting the nation. But only the real fans, the true fans, the hardcore fans, the ride or die fans who have been with us since day one. When this podcast started out as a podcast that was done exclusively on CB radio. That's where we got our start. Yes. That's when Convoy was the number one song in America. That's when we started. Our podcast used to be specifically for truckers. Well, that was back when we were Midnight and Blaze. Yeah, we were loaded up in trucking. Yeah. People were like, a podcast? Uh, that can't be done. But we said, we going to do what they say can't be done. Right. And I, we, knew, we knew that the podcast had a long way to go and a short time to get there. But, I mean, our podcast was really eastbounded. But it, only the real fans, the true fans of this podcast would know two, the two main facts about us. The two undeniably really real and in no way made up on the spot facts about the both of us, America's hottest podcasting couple, Bunny and Maylin. Yes. First and foremost, Bunny, the first fact, which is about you, is the fact that when you're not doing this podcast, you actually work as a wet nurse. Now, uh, tell us, Bunny, what inspired you to be a wet nurse? Didn't we, didn't we do this a couple of weeks back? Yeah, but here's the thing. I still don't know what a wet nurse is. Is that like a wet t-shirt <coughs> thing? Is it a nurse that just waters you? I don't even know what a wet nurse is. Uh, it's it's. It sounds your like a breasts porn are thing. still full of milk, so oh. you feed oh. other children. Okay, I thought wet nurse was just the name of a. Of, of a specific category on Pornhub. So I'm glad. Well, that... I'm not sure that it isn't. I've never thought to look. That's a good point. It most probably could be. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we could find people wet nursing old men. Uh, I. I... I'm really starting to sicken myself right now. I'm sorry. It's it's okay. It's okay. I, we'll move on. I I ran through the. I was like Doctor Strange right there for a second. I was going through all the possibilities of <laughs> nice. Okay, that's cool. wet nurse on Pornhub. Yeah. And most of it was not pleasant. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. And the second fact, which is about me, is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So this is the part of the podcast where I get a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know that well, and reword it via my own unique storytelling panache. And that's what this is, another educationally uneducational installment of Steve's Historic Approximations. Dun, dun, dun. Or Shap, as I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wants me to or not. Now, personally, I like the name Shap, and I asked my six-year-old daughter what they thought Shap sounded like, and they said that Shap sounds like a cupcake. I'm not entirely sure what that means, but I'd like to think that it means that this segment of the podcast is so tasty with yes. knowledge <laughs> my freaking neighbors are mowing the lawn i think i'm gonna sue them because uh way to mess with the podcast we're such professionals here yes way to ruin everything anywho this week on the old Shappity Shap Shap, we will be talking about america's most notorious anti-gay activist and how her connections to a theme park mascot led to a nationwide boycott of a breakfast food. And okay, this isn't the world's most unknown story that we've ever done here on the podcast. 
In fact, once I say this woman's name, a lot of people, a lot of people, probably including you, Bonnie, will go, oh, yeah, that woman. I remember this yes. story. Oh, yeah. But the whole point of Shap is to try and teach small, important parts of history to people who have never heard these stories before. And I guarantee you, there are a lot of people at a theme park <coughs> right now that have no idea that they're in line at a snack. Uh, at, at, they're in line at a uh, place to get like a treats, snack, a, a food place. And they have no idea that that place that they're in line for has ties to an anti-gay activist. Yes. So, so I, so I do think that this should be dedicated to J.K. Rowling right? upon the re re release of her brilliant, brilliant new book. Yeah. Well, fuck J.K. Rowling. So a lot of people out there don't know that there was a time when uh, uh, gay activists avoided orange juice because of the Disney Corporation. Like that's this is this is interesting to me. So, OK. Uh, this is odd AF, and this is our story. So before I start, I want to say that this shap came from a number of different sources, Wikipedia, or maybe it's pr pronounced Wikipedia. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. A handful of LGBT plus websites and resources, and uh, a great YouTube account called Dream Sounds. All one word, Dream Sounds. Uh, shout out to them. It is a Disney fan YouTube account, but about a year or two ago, the, the person who runs the YouTube channel came out as a trans woman. So now it's a YouTube channel about Disney history and Disney films from a trans female perspective. And they did a, a short little uh, 10 minute video about. Uh, the time that gays of what's, avoided. What's the show? Yeah, uh, it's a YouTube channel called Dream Sounds. Okay. And it's just a Disney fandom from a trans perspective, and I, I really dig it. And they did a short little video about this subject, and so so let's talk about the history behind the breakfast boycott. So. Uh, before we start gleefully shitting on America's most notorious anti-gay activist, let's yes. talk about the history behind the breakfast boycott. Okay, so the story starts <coughs> in Florida. America's penis. This uh, this part might seem a bit uh, familiar to you, Bonnie. So it's the 1930s, and uh, there's a bunch of orange growers all throughout Florida. And there's an orange grower here and an orange grower there and an orange grower there. All these orange farms all over the place. And each one is fighting each other, trying to get a piece of the orange market. And right. finally, a bunch of the orange growers got together and said, huh, maybe we should start one big company, all of us together. And we can work together helping each other out. Basically, it's the East Coast version of the Raisin Mafia. You remember the yes, Raisin Mafia Yes, I remember Mafia the story? Raisin Mafia. That was from three years ago, uh, a shap from August of 2019. Uh, a bunch of the raisin growers got together and, and they started a, their own sort of company. And that company came up with the California raisins. So basically, this is the Florida version of that, but without the corruption and the fighting and the mafia aspect. Right. And that... that uh... And the California raisins were triggering off in my head. Yeah. As related to one of the one of the pieces. And we'll get to the character, but I thought the character was similar to the California raisin. It kind in of is. principle. Kind of is. Yeah. No, we're getting to the character. A right. very popular character. Let me know when I, when I should be flipping these slides. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I've got I've I've got it all marked out and everything. I'm all right. Taking this one very seriously. So all of the orange people in Florida, they got together. And in 1933, they became the Florida Citrus Canners Cooperative. The Fakakaka. <laughs> <laughs> the Fakakaka. The Florida Citrus Canners Cooperative 
this organization, this company is actually still around. Now they're called Florida's Natural. Okay. Which is a pretty major brand out there. You ever see Florida's Natural? That that started out as the Florida Citrus Canners Cooperative, the Fakakaka. So they <laughs> formed their own big orange company, and they're selling orange juice throughout the 30s. So now it's the 40s, and they're doing okay business, but they're not doing the best business. They're trying to sell more orange juice, and they're getting together in their, I don't know, their boardroom big wooden desk like uh like in uh Rorator pharmaceuticals yeah in brain candy there's a new season of kids in the hall apropos of nothing there's a new season of kids in the hall on amazon prime and i said i'm gonna watch it but then i stopped because it's like no with i am such a completist that i have to watch all five seasons of kids in the hall then I have to watch uh, Kids in the Hall Brain Candy for like yeah. the 100th time. Then I have to watch the documentary Same Kids New Dresses about their reunion tour. Then I have to watch the miniseries, uh, what is it called, Death Comes to Town. And then I can finally watch. So I just finished all five seasons of Kids in the Hall and I'm about to watch Brain Candy again. And it's just so upsetting to me that I can't just watch these new episodes. I have to watch everything. Yeah. This is how my brain works. I have kids in the hall on the brain right now. I I am so deep into kids in the hall. I, so, I will be interested in what you say about the new season. I've watched a few episodes. I saw kids and in the hall I, live, And then I stopped, actually. and I don't know. I, I just haven't gotten back to it for some reason. When they first uh, did their first reunion tour, they came to Phoenix. And my friend Michelle and I went to see them together. Yeah. I saw Kids in the Hall live, and I forget that. Yeah, I'm like, holy crap, I saw the Kids in the Hall live. I also watched a uh, documentary about them called Kids in the Hall Comedy Punks. There was a great bit in there where they say, we were hoping to be the comedy equivalent of Nirvana, but instead, we were Sonic Youth. <laughs> meaning, meaning that like uh yeah we were influential we made no money oh as opposed to nirvana we were influential and we made a ton of money and we were everywhere no we weren't nirvana we were sonic youth okay so it's the 40s they're not selling orange juice so they're like huh oh, what can we do uh man you you know who's not wanting to buy are Fakaka orange juice kids. Kids are not wanting to buy it. How can we get kids to want to buy, buy our orange juice? Hey, I've got an idea. What if we put an anthropomorphic duck without pants on our orange juice? Okay, now you can put up the first picture. And it, I always wondered why. It was always so weird to me. It's like, oh, there's that orange juice, there's that orange juice, there's that orange juice. Why does Donald Duck have an orange juice? I always thought that was so weird. Yeah. Why is there a Donald Duck orange juice? But yeah, uh, th that's how we got Donald Duck orange juice. And Donald Duck orange juice became so popular that in the 50s, in the late 40s, and then in the 50s and the 60s, Donald Duck was on so much more food. Yeah. Because when I was growing up, oh yeah, I remember, I, I always saw Donald Duck orange juice, but I didn't realize that before I was born, there was Donald Duck grapefruit, Donald Duck frozen food, Donald Duck fish fillets, Donald Duck popcorn, Donald Duck peanut butter, Donald Duck sherbet ice cream, and my personal favorite, Donald Duck cheese quackers. Oh. Huh? 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 Oh. Do you get it, buddy? I mean, do you get yeah. it? Yeah. So you might be wondering what this has to do with hating gay people, but we're almost there. Okay. Yes. We're almost there. So uh, Donald Duck becomes like the face of. And it's also a bit of interesting Disney history because suddenly Walt Disney is like, wow, can you imagine? Can you imagine? We have one of our characters in every supermarket. 
How interesting. I never would have thought that you would see a Disney character everywhere that yeah. like Donald was the first one. Nowadays, you go to any store, you're going to find a Disney character in it. But Donald Duck was like the first one. Yeah. Donald Duck started appearing everywhere. So so now it's the 70s. Well, because he, he's a he's a sailor, you know, yeah, so he's, he's like sailor. military. So he's just like infiltrating other parts of life. Yeah, you know. and there's, I also, one of the things that I always thought of is that Don, it makes sense for Donald Duck to be selling orange juice because he is a sailor. They do get scurvy. Yeah. So, like, he probably needs the, like, vitamin D to help him be healthy. Donald Duck probably has scurvy and a bunch of venereal diseases. Going to yeah. port to port. That's yes. what happens. It happens. So now it's the uh, the late sixties, and Disney is making a theme park, a new theme park, Walt Disney World, and because it's being built in Florida, the Disney people say, you know, we've had a three decade relationship with the Florida Citrus Canners, the Fakaka Cup people, and that's been really successful for us. So it makes sense if we're going to be building this new theme park. We got to find a way to to put orange juice into it in our new theme park. And they come up with an idea. OK, so Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Pluto, uh, Minnie, they're at every theme park. You can see them at Disneyland and Disney World and Disney's California Adventure and Tokyo Disney and Euro Disney and all of the parks. OK, but Florida has their own mascot okay that you can't see anywhere else they have their own individual character exclusive to disney world and that character you can put up the second picture that character is known as orange bird yes so most people i think that most people will look at orange bird and say orange bird who the fuck is Orange Bird? I don't know Orange Bird. But here's the thing. If you went to Disney World a lot, maybe you went to Disney World a lot as a kid. Maybe you lived in Florida. Maybe you grew up in Florida, in the Florida area. There's a good chance you know Orange Bird. So he has an orange for a head. And here's an important part to the story. He doesn't talk. He thinks things. And those thoughts get... But he doesn't have a voice. That is kind of important to the story. So uh, so Disney created Orange Bird for the Florida Citrus Canners Cooperative. And in exchange for that, the Florida Citrus Canners, the Fakakaka people, sponsored the Enchanted Tiki Room in, <coughs> in Disney World. And also the new Florida Citrus Sunshine Pavilion in Adventureland where you could go and you could buy orange juice and orange juice items and they have like like a orange juice sherbet and like i don't know dole whips that sort of thing and you can meet orange bird as you can see there in the picture orange bird was a character yeah. and there was merchandise everywhere they had orange bird t-shirts and orange bird plushies and orange bird was uh, all over florida and people in florida knew orange bird cuz you can't go to california and see Orange Bird. You can't go to, you, you couldn't go to, you know, Tokyo Disney and see Orange Bird. You couldn't. Note my words, couldn't, but we'll get to that. The, uh, the Disney people would eventually go so uh, balls deep into promoting Orange Bird that they tapped the legendary Sherman Brothers to write an Orange Bird song. Uh, the Sherman Brothers were the songsmiths for the Disney company. They were in the movie Saving Mr. Banks. Did you ever see that with Tom Hanks as Walt Disney? Uh, no, I've threatened to watch it a couple of times, and I've seen bits of it. It's interesting because they've only made like three movies. They've only ever filmed like three or four movies at Disneyland. And two of them had Tom Hanks in it. I find that fascinating. But anyway, 
Uh, Ryan the Tenth from The Office and Inglorious Bastards was one of the Sherman brothers in that movie. So <coughs> the legendary Sherman brothers wrote a super catchy song, a theme song for Orange Bird. It was called Little Orange Bird. It's catchy AF. It is a catchy, adorable Disney song. And it discusses the Orange Bird story and how Orange Bird doesn't talk. And, you know, he, he, he has thought bubbles like Garfield, I guess. But he doesn't have a voice. So, okay, if we're going to do this song, we can't have Orange Bird sing it because Orange Bird doesn't have a voice. We need to get a singer that will become the voice, the spokesperson, the voice of Orange Bird. Huh, it's 1971. Who can we get to sing this catchy song? Hmm, we need someone safe. We need someone Disney friendly. Someone family friendly. Someone who will definitely not get us into trouble. And who do they pick? And you can switch it to picture three. Oklahoma native and non-threatening pop singer, Anita freaking Bryant. <laughs> Man, yeah, she was chosen as the voice of Orange Bird because Orange Bird didn't talk in 1969. She already had three gold records, and then the Florida Citrus Canners Cooperative, the Fakakaka people, uh, hired her to be their spokesperson for commercials. And she was on all these commercials for Florida Citrus. And the tagline was breakfast without orange juice is like a day without sunshine. So in 1971, Disney went to Anita Bryant and, and gave her the Sherman Brothers song, and they released the single Little Orange Bird, sung by Anita Bryant. Uh, and Anita Bryant, the spokesperson for Florida Citrus, would appear at Disney World with Orange Bird. And like, oh, here's here she is. She's going to sing her song, Little Orange Bird, here at Walt Disney World. And look who's there next to her. It's Orange Bird, the two of them together. Hey, they're going to be in this parade, in the, I don't know, the Orange Bowl parade. And oh, man, Anita Bryant was everywhere being pushed by Disney as the singer of the official Orange Bird song. She was also very religious. She was also very conservative. Wasn't she also a previous Miss America or something? Uh, yeah, she was like a... She won Miss Oklahoma. Yeah. She was born and raised in Oklahoma, and then she won Miss Oklahoma, and then she became like a national beauty pageant contestant winner, and then she parlayed that into a pop singing career, and then she became the spokesperson for Florida, and then she started working for Disney. So she moved to Florida, and she's living there now, working with the Fakakaka people in Disney. And then in the late 70s, in Florida, the government wanted to pass a gay non-discrimination ordinance. And Florida said, hey, we're going to make, it's the 70s. We're going to make it illegal to discriminate against someone because they're gay. And guess who became the most vocal opponent to that? Noted bitch Anita Bryant. Pop singer and famous piece of shit Anita Bryant. I've got one more. Florida Orange's spokesperson and horrible demon woman who will one day burn in the fieriest pits of hell, Anita fucking Bryant. You can switch it to picture four. Anita Bryant was basically the founder, the godmother of the modern day anti-gay movement. You yes. look now in 2022 and people are saying, oh, gays are groomers. We need to get rid of gay people. We need to get rid of their rights. We need to we need to get rid of uh, 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 of all these laws that protect them. We need to take away their right to marriage, their right to adopt. You can draw a line and easily draw a line from her in 19 from Anita Bryan in 1977 directly to people in 2022 saying gay people are groomers trans people should be locked up in cages because Florida heard Anita Bryant's words Anita Bryant was on TV all over the place rallying against gay people she literally said passing this ordinance violates my rights as a Christian she was the first ever famous person to come out and say just like yeah uh 
fuck gay people. Yeah. Uh, and Florida heard what she said and said, yeah, sorry. Oh, everybody Orange. heard what she said. Everybody yeah. heard what she said. She was all over the you, place. You, you grab anything at random from popular culture at that point, there's going to be an Anita Bryan joke. Johnny yeah. Carson used to make jokes about her all the fucking time. The dummy in Soap made an Anita yes. Bryant joke. It was yeah. all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, she was the absolute worst. And the things that she said about gay people to demonize them in 1977 are still still being used today. That's how horrible she was. But... Florida did say that, like, okay, yeah, we hear your words, orange juice lady, but we're gonna we're gonna pass this shit anyway. So they passed the anti discrimination law in Florida, and that's when Anita Bryant went full on Karen and said, okay, well, I'm giving up music, and I'm just dedicating the rest of my life to taking away gay people's rights. Yeah. She just decided to dedicate the rest of her existence to rallying against gay people. And she started a group, which you can see uh, here next to me, called Save Our Children. Yeah. And she called for a special referendum to repeal this ordinance. And this group really is in, in the 70s wearing bell bottoms and listening to the Bee Gees this was the birth of our modern far right Christian conservative thing. She <laughs> was the first QAnon Pizzagate, Alex Jones, turn the frickin' frogs gay, all of those yeah. nutball people that we're dealing with right now. They were born in 1977 with this woman right here. Yeah. She was the, she was the, this was the first real time that you saw someone on TV saying the, you know who the real victim is of this. It's not that I hate gay people. It's that I care about the children. Yeah. Like uh, Reverend Lovejoy's wife in The Simpsons. Can somebody please think of the children? And her basic thesis, which she was on TV spouting all the time, was, okay, gay people, they're getting together, they're doing gay stuff, but, oh, they can't uh, biologically have children. So how do they get a new generation of people to be gay? Ah, they, uh, they recruit them. They groom them. Ooh, the evil, the gays are coming, the gays are coming. So, if you like And kids, you know what? And you know what? Huh. That's what was behind the National Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes. Exactly. Right yeah. there. If you won that sweepstakes, well, not even if you won, if you sent in the envelope... Okay? Yeah. And entered? You had to be gay from then on. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much it's all a conspiracy. You know they put chemicals in the water. Yeah. To turn yeah. the freaking frogs gay. It's the I mean, chemtrails. Yeah. It's the chemtrails. They're dropping the, the, the gay juice on <laughs> us. Gay juice. You like the juice, huh? <laughs> You like the juice. The juice is good. I get you more the juice. <coughs> so, <coughs> hey, do you like children? Do you want children to be happy and healthy? If you do, then pick up a Molotov cocktail and chuck it at these gays with me, Anita Bryant. This is my entire life now. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, when you hear. And you could see the similarities between her and, in particular, J.K. Rowling. Yeah. We have gone from Anita Bryant to uh, gay people coming out and gay people being accepted and gay people earning rights and gay people being everywhere. And then we're just going right back to Anita Bryant right now. Yeah. Is where we are right now. We're going right back to Anita Bryant. 
So, okay, 10 minute warning. Gotcha. So, um, you see, so it here's too? a, huh? You saw the 10 minute warning too? Yeah. Okay. So Anita Bryant started all of this QAnon Pizzagate Alex Jones nutballs in the 70s. Here's a pop singing celebrity on TV telling families that gay people molest kids, which is BS, obviously. But this was all happening less than a decade after the Stonewall riots kickstarted the LGBT rights movement. The gay yes. civil rights movement was still in its infancy. And people saw what was happening in Florida as a test case. And it's like, oh, man, it, they're going to try and and do this nationwide. But this is the first that like the like patient zero is right here in Florida. Uh, so the gays started forming groups and organizing, started organizations of their own. They started doing speeches and protests. They raised money and they thought, how do you attack a famous person like Anita Bryant? And so their answer was basically... And you can switch it to picture five, Bunny. We're going to kick that cunt right in the citrus. This began the nationwide orange juice boycott. The gay rights movement, still in its infancy, rallied together to boycott all orange juice as a way to fight Anita Bryant and her anti-gay beliefs. This was the first major boycott organized by solely by gay and lesbian activists. And it was a big deal. Started in Florida, continued all over the place. Uh, Gay-friendly bars and restaurants would gather together at a specific time and go outside of their establishments and pour orange juice into the streets. Gay, gay uh, activists would be on the streets trying to collect money and it wouldn't work. So you know what they would do? They would get cans and they'd go to bars and nightclubs and gay friendly establishments and say, hey, we're raising money to 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 fight Anita Bryant. And people, gay people would be like, fuck that bitch. Here's all of my change. Yeah. And and. Uh, uh, there were rallies nationwide. It started spreading all over the place. And here they are in the East Coast fighting it. In the West Coast, Harvey Milk himself urged people in a Bay Area newspaper <laughs> to start waking up drinking pineapple juice for breakfast. That's crazy. Nice. So, and then uh, here's Anita Bryan on TV saying, oh, the gays are attacking me. The gays are rallying together to try and attack me solely because I'm Christian. They hate families. They hate common people like you and me. And then, ah, oh, she gets hit in the face with a pie. Yes. On TV. Mwah! Chef's kiss. Chef's kiss followed by Italian hand gestures for the people not watching this on yes. Twitch. Uh, there, they became it became this huge anti Anita Bryant movement, and the fight went on for months until Anita Bryant went nuclear. She hired Republican politicians and activists and started assaulting Florida's TV stations with ads that tied the Orange Bowl parade with gay pride parades. Oh. Okay. What? But the ads worked, and in June of 1977, uh, Florida overturned the ordinance, and it became okay to uh, discriminate against gay people. But the orange juice boycott continued, and it seemed to have done its job because two weeks after the vote, the PR guy for the Pukukuka people, the the Fukukuka people, the Florida yeah. Citrus Company came out and just basically said outright, basically, uh, fucking man, I don't know how we got dragged into this. We're just trying to sell frickin' citrus. We don't hate gay people. And honestly, we're hoping Anita Bryan steps down as our spokesperson because we're done with the, the gay hating. That was her idea, not ours. We're just trying to sell these frickin' oranges, man. And she refused to step down. So eventually the orange juice company fired her. Really? And a, yeah. And here's a, it, it gets better. So was she canceled? She lost her sponsorship. She lost her music career, her marriage. She went bankrupt numerous times. And now she lives a life of quiet isolation 
running an Anita Bryant Ministries in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And I just want to take this time to say that I did not try and find her location so I could TP her house. Yeah. And even if I did, I wouldn't be able to find it. Anywho, so that's a that's a happy thing. But let's go back a little bit, okay? Okay. This all put Disney in an awkward AF position because Orange Bird is cute as fuck, but Anita Bryant was Orange Bird's voice. And now Anita Bryant is gone from the Florida Citrus people. So where does that leave our cute ass theme park mascot? So Disney had no choice. They got rid of little Orange Bird. No more mascot, no more merch, no more song. And so starting in the late 70s and throughout the 80s and 90s and 2000s, Orange Bird was scrubbed completely from Walt Disney World, from Disney, period. Disney got rid of Orange Bird because of Anita Bryant and her anti-gay activism. Isn't that crazy? Like, Orange Bird was a casualty in all of this. Yes. So Orange Bird was gone for decades. Then... Randomly, in 2004, Orange Bird came back at Tokyo Disney. Really? Here's why. Okay, so the sun kiss people in Japan are like, huh, how can we get people to buy our product? So they came up with this weird idea. It's a fairly new holiday, but on April 14th in Japan, it's Orange Day. And you buy orange colored products for the people you love on April 14th. It's Orange Day and it's promoted by Orange Growers and the Sunkiss Company. And it's this Japan only orange holiday. And the people of Tokyo Disneyland are like, huh, so Orange Day is a big thing. Wasn't there an orange mascot? And so suddenly, after decades, uh, Japan has Orange Bird merchandise, and all of the uh, uh, theme park people in Florida are going, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> So eventually, uh, in 2012, Orange Bird came back. Now you can put it on uh, picture six. So eventually, Orange Bird came back in Florida in 2012. So this is a sort of a, a recent thing that Orange Bird has come back. And now here in 2022, you can go back to the uh, Sunshine Tree Terrace in Adventureland in Disney World. And you can see Orange Bird on the sign. And you you can go in and buy Orange Bird shirts and Orange Bird merchandise. Orange Bird was the official mascot of the 2022 Epcot Flower and Garden Festival. Orange Bird is all over the place in Florida right now. But I dare say. A lot of people in line right now at the Sunshine Tree Terrace to get themselves an orange treat have no idea that the character in front of them, Orange Bird, disappeared for decades because of a bigot who lives in Oklahoma. Yes. That's a crazy story. And I just want to take this I just want to take this time to say, uh, Buccanita Bryant, she's a horrible person. And she has made millions of people's life miserable. Millions of people's life miserable. Uh, And uh, my wife got upset when I said this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. Fuck orange juice. (laughs) I'm going to drink Sunny D. That's barely orange juice. Sunny D and Tang from now on. Okay. But Orange Bird gets a pass. That sucker is cute as hell. Yeah. Orange Bird gets a pass. And that is it for this week's installment of Steve's Historic Approximations. Be sure and join us next week for more educationally uneducational fun. And cut on that! Woo!